My name is Bill Hellman. Thanks Hellman. for joining. Wow. I mean, truly, what a week. Hang on a second. Let's take this. Let's start from the top again. I'm still Bill Hellman. It wasn't actually a week. It was only three days, but it sure felt like a week. And what an amazing set of topics, issues, speakers. If ever there was any doubt about the role of the Arthur Lee Irving Institute for Energy and Society and the role it might play in, yes, taking on our world's greatest problems, never again. These were really significant and important conversations. So, so thank you to everybody who organized and thank you to everybody who participated. I was incredibly impressed that we kicked off with Mary Nichols. Mary Nichols is an iconic leader in this movement. She's behind CARB, the California regulatory agency that's taken on, in fact, the federal government for example, on mileage standards and things like that. And what Mary had to say, I thought was amazing, talking about an inflection point, how people are ready. And most importantly, she said, we have to be careful because it's human nature to, to postpone the hardest decisions and we must not, we must take this on. I, I, I must also add, I'm so thankful to the Irvings. Their inspiration, their vision has been really driving, no pun intended, this whole endeavor. And what an honor to be participating in the first ever Irving Energy Forum. And, and just a little sidebar, that last session, Sandra's words on light, oh my goodness, incredible. I don't know how she does it, she does it every time. She moves all of us to think about our world in a different way. So thank you, Sandra. Okay, now it's time to pull it all together. Yes, this is the capstone. This is the final event of the conference. There's a thousand of us depending on, yes, Jim Coulter to make sense of all of it. And the way it works at Dartmouth is they give you a big, long, a big, big, long list of accomplishments. These are Jim's um, lengthy accomplishments. It's an impressive list. Of course, it's an impressive list. It's pages long. Duh, that's why he's our keynote speaker. But I wanna focus on a different part of Jim. And in a second, I'm gonna ask him to comment on his experiences, his ambitions, his passions. Um, but, but the way I think about Jim and his wife, Penny, his family, which includes Audrey, class of 15, we are so lucky to have them in our community. They take on all the toughest problems. They are completely focused on changing our world long before this conference. They are uh, true leaders. They do everything with gusto. And I just, I just, I'm so excited to have Jim with us and to have Jim and Penny on our team. Okay, so Jim, I'm really sorry to skip those decades of accomplishments, uh, <laughs> but I wanna get started. You said that this, this climate change thing is the fourth wave of your personal narrative of your personal career. So tell us if you're willing, of course, given there's a thousand people listening, you have no choice. What's influenced you? Why now? What about this fourth wave? Bill, I'm glad you didn't go through a list of accomplishments, but I'd like to add one, which I had the courage to, when asked to choose an interviewer to choose you, because the one thing you know about Bill is he will get to the point, but he will get in there in, in ways that you don't expect. So I, I've been looking forward to this I heard the first. I heard the first six said no. So thank you for making <laughs> choice number seven. So the, the title of this conference has been investing in our energy futures, and, and uh, it's been an extraordinary conference, and investment comes in a lot of uh, different ways, investments in research, investments in careers, investments in new ideas. I'm actually investing in investing. So at the moment, I'm uh, uh, investing deeply in the what we're calling the climate revolution. And as an investor, day-to-day, uh, -day we build a portfolio, as you know, Bill, making individual company decisions. But within a career, there's a few arcs that drive what we do and really define our long-term success. success. And for me, I think there's probably been three dominant arcs over the last 30 years. The first was the interest rate super cycle. Came out of Dartmouth, rates were 15%, they're zero. That's been a good time to be investing in levered equities called LBOs. The second was globalization, where we took supply chains and businesses and spread them around the world. We moved and started to invest in Asia in 1994. And the third was really the digital revolution, still ongoing born 20 plus years ago, affected every business, but created new ways of living, new business models, et cetera. It's absolutely clear to me that we're now facing the, th the fourth of these major cycles in my career. And that is gonna be the uh, decarbonization of the economy, where we're going to take a hundred year trend of building most of what we make and how we travel on a carbon-based environment 
and moving this idea of energy and how we make things to another paradigm. That is an extraordinary moment as an investor, a unprecedented uh, challenge for society and something on the scale seldom before imagined. And uh, I, I'm all in on that at the moment and uh, uh, deeply engaged, but also frankly, deeply interested. So, so how, how are you gonna go about trying to figure this out? I mean, you think historically about economic sectors. You've just told us this is a really important sector. You've just said you're all in, but I mean, it's massive. How do you, you're so good at this kind of thinking. How do you get your arms around it? How do you, how do you think about um, the landscape, if you will, of what you're talking about? Um, first of all, we do come out with, with a sector approach, uh, Bill. And, and so when I say sector, for those of you who don't apply the, uh, the investment taxonomy, we think of healthcare as a sector, technology as a sector. Sectors are often um, indicated by areas that there's a ton of conferences. It's where people want to get together, ideas want to get together, markets develop in a way that are interconnected and deep. So if you begin to think about climate, uh, first of all, I approach it with solving the problem is immensely complex. And maybe we're going to try something, everyone. We're going to try putting up some slides here just sort of intermittently, and we'll hope the tech works. But I'd like to go to page 15. Travis, if you could. And uh, if you think about addressing the climate energy issue, uh, we all have the natural tendency to want to have the silver bullet. And what I mean by silver bullet, it's transportation, it's the grid, et cetera. The problem with climate is you have to have silver buckshot. Uh, we have put carbon and uh, the genesis of CO2 in everything. And so we have to take it out of everything. If you think about this ring, and all of you have seen this in different shapes and forms, spend a massive amount of time thinking about transportation or the grid, but there's an extraordinary amount of emissions in agriculture, in uh, land use, and in, in industrials everywhere. So you begin by understanding that this effort is a large interconnected set of risks. And also as investors, it's therefore a large interconnected uh, type of opportunity. And uh, yeah, Bill, if we could also, I think, go to page 13. Bill, you, you and I talked about this a little before. Uh, we both went through the early days of the tech revolution. And when I started investing in tech in the mid-90s, someone said it was hardware and there was software. It was like a hardware analyst and a software analyst. Those of you who are organizing your thoughts and, and your careers around energy, uh, today, uh, the taxonomy that we bring to it is often renewables and clean tech. Renewables being things you can touch, windmills, uh, uh, wind farms, uh, solar farms, and clean tech, things that might come later. But in fact, when you look at the market more generally, it's not hardware, software. It's like the first time, Bill, you and I saw a Gartner Group slide with all the subgroups of SaaS and enterprise right. software, et cetera. Right. So this is an internal slide to TPG. We could spend the next hour on this. We won't, but I, I put it up to just capture the complexity. We are following 80 different subsectors here arrayed by um, on the y-axis, the amount of drawdown they generally uh, uh, exhibit. The, the x-axis, the type of return threshold, the size of the bubble is the investable market. The color is the growth rate of that market. And what you get is an extraordinary set of interlocking opportunities. Right now, for example, Bill, there's massive amount of uh, focus on the OEM market for automobiles. You are on the Ford board, you, board, you understand it. It's wild. There's like 20 players, all of whom think they're going to get a 20 share. But if you want to begin to think about investing in OEM EVs, you better understand batteries. And right. once you understand batteries, you better understand battery recycling, you better understand cobalt mining, you better understand anodes, cathodes, separators. Is it going to be solid state? Is it going to be new age lithium ion? And the intersection of those things become a sector, just as in healthcare, the intersection of drug delivery, drug research, patient provider insurance all comes together for a societal need and a societal delivery of, of, of a, basic, um, a basic piece of who we are. So today, as we look forward to this new era, we are remaking who we are around the energy era. And this intersection is massively complex. Okay, but Jim, I, so my world is technology, innovation and technology. 
it does fit together to me, right? So this thing comes along the internet. So we need a pipe. So we need pieces of hardware to make things go faster. We need software to help us interpret and find things on the internet. We need security, like a little fire. It all seems to fit together. But when I look at this thing, I mean, this is incredibly complicated. And you just compared batteries for EV. And you also said agriculture on the prior slide was really important. So how do you reconcile how do you reconcile batteries, EVs with, let's just say, you know, new forms of protein, new forms of mm -hmm. agriculture that would be better for, you know, less methane, better for the environment? It seems like they're like you have 20 different sectors here. No, at, at the subsectors, just as you do within technology, et cetera. So, yeah, I mean, batteries and EVs, one of the big issues in agriculture is how do you get to green in agriculture? I was on the phone recently with the CEO of, of John Deere. An electric tractor is not a very useful thing because batteries are too heavy. The tractors right. sink. So if you're going to get after a you know fully green product, it gets in the water and, and different types of things. As you know, fertilizer is a massive um, energy uh, sink of, of sorts and potentially even a battery of sorts. So there's these these things are all interactive. I mean, the way I think about the problem in layman's terms, uh, Bill, is uh, you know we get very caught up in the fact that this is carbon, and thank God that we're taking on this this absolutely critical world need. But as an investor, if I just came to you, Bill, and said, listen, here's, here's the situation. For 100 years, we have been putting widgets in everything, right. really widgets in everything we do. And suddenly, within a five-year period of time, a number of things happen. The government says no more widgets, CEOs say no more widgets, customers say no more widgets, investors say no more widgets, and the price of widgets changes dramatically such that anti-widgets are now more critical. I'd want to be in the anti-widget business. And so what we are thinking about here is this is a multi-complex, it's a system problem. It's one of the reasons why this institute in Dartmouth is so well positioned to play a role here is if it was a deep science, you know, single type of problem, you know, maybe a, a research, um, a single researcher would make the difference. This is a systems problem that, that touches all sorts of industries and all sorts of practices. All right, so let's talk about that for just another minute because you've called it a systems problem. I've also heard you in the past call it a liberal arts problem. Is that just because you're sucking up to your friends at Dartmouth and you want them to know <laughs> liberal arts is important? Or how does that, how does that play? Uh, you know, I'm, sure I, Phil Han, I'm sure Phil Hanlon's on the call, so you better, you better have a good answer here. Well, at, at the end of the day, um, as people know, the, the best technology doesn't necessarily win. You have to have the inner section of technology and society. So uh, you know, there's some that might argue the best technology for this is uh, nuclear. Uh, and yet the green parties of Europe will, will never allow that to be the answer in the near term. So you're gonna have to begin to bring together this balance of political, societal and technological answers. I don't know what the right answer is, but I know that it's not coming out of some lab alone. It's gotta come through the combination of innovation and scaling. We can maybe, if I could jump back to the slides again to page 17, because there is something here. So I, I, I'm really fascinated by the analogy between the technological revolution we all live through and what we're now legging into. And, and for me, Bill, this feels a little bit like 1999 in the technological revolution and yeah, all these companies. That's, that's my year I got out of Dartmouth. Yeah, and in some ways, uh, I, you know, in some ways, I think it may not end the same way, but I might argue that Tesla is AOL. It's the first big company yeah. that we yeah. know in the area. It's not the last, and it probably will end differently than AOL. So we're going to see generations of companies, generations of solution, solutions in business models we don't even think. But one of the things that is fundamentally different in this revolution is the amount of capital required. Right. So... Um, and, and this is, in some ways, one of the things that we have to evolve our venture capital thinking a little bit. And in particular, the problem of scale is important here. So this is, um, these are six companies. This is a trillion dollars of market cap. I had a hard time even saying it. it was unimaginable a while ago. These, these six companies are a trillion dollars of market cap. Their combined actual annual uh, capital expense is $3 billion, 0.3% of market value in CapEx. We know we're just the beginning of the climate revolution, but already today, we're spending just in the e early days of the EV market, go to the next slide, EV market and, and renewables, we're already spending um, 500 million 
Can we advance the slide for them, please? We're already spending 500 um, billion a year in renewable spending. Uh, I mean, think about the difference there. And to get to where we need to get by 2050, we need to be spending something like, if we go to the next slide, well over $4 trillion a year. So the big difference between the last revolution and this revolution is this is going to be a massively capital consumptive revolution. And, and, um, and, and more of the returns and more of the need is going to go to capital. And the, in the technological world, Bill, you guys had a great idea. The internet was already built for you. The government gave it for you for free. You could A-B test your way to, to uh, uh, brilliance. And uh, this took off with very little capital. You go back and think about the original auto revolution, the original railroad revolution. Those were capital-based revolutions. This is likely to look a lot more like that. So this is clear, I'm sorry to interrupt, this is one of the themes of this whole set of days, right, is, is, is how do we get to the required investment? And this is what you've called in the past scaling uh, capital. And so, and so as a result, dot, 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 this leads you to raise a fund, which you're very good at. And tell us a little bit about why a fund, how big a fund, you're going to do it with this guy named Hank Paulson. So a, a Dartmouth guy, a very well-known Dartmouth guy, a climate advocate for a long, long time, way ahead of his time. You told me the other day you're only going to hire Dartmouth people for the fund. That's good to know. <laughs> uh, I think you also told me, and this would be interesting, Jim, that you've that in that process you probably had five or six hundred calls with people, and you've learned a lot. So tell us, I, I, I'm I'm mumble jumbling a bunch of questions here. Tell us about the fund, how you think about the fund. Tell us about the experience of talking to the outside world, the six five six hundred calls, what you've learned, and what maybe surprised you to the extent you're ever surprised. I'm often surprised. Uh, uh, so if we, if we go to page 11 on the slides, I'll stay in the slides for a minute and then I'll, I'll, I'll give you the background. So first of all, you raise a fund, not because you can, you raise a fund because there's opportunities. And a number of years ago, Bill, as you know, uh, we raised the largest impact fund um, in the private equities, a, a business called Rise, which is uh, uh, currently about a $6 billion platform that does impact investing. And one of the sectors we focused on was climate. And so we went to market, we went out and told people, we wanna see anything that touches climate. And I'll tell you in the early days, like 2016, 2017, it was a little bit slow because solar is, is too low return for us in, in, its, in its sort of uh, right. uh, infrastructure way. But suddenly right. about three years ago, things changed. And it wasn't the 2015 Accords. It was, um, it was a change in the unsubsidized piece of, the climate investing landscape. And I think it's driven by four forces, which we, we note here. So first of all, you started to hear this idea of net zero pledges. This slide's a little old. I think we're at 2000 net zero pledges. So if you are a CEO, you can't talk about next quarter, but you can take a victory lap for the fact that you're gonna do something in 2030 on climate. And so CEOs everywhere know they have to have a position on this. The second thing that happens is what I call the Greta, Greta effect, which is consumers are now buying green products. And Bill, everyone thought this would crack as soon as we had some sort of economic hit. We just went through a global pandemic and it accelerated. Yeah, in right. some ways, I think, I think it, you know, this was a big surprise to people like, oh, that green stuff, that'll go away. I think the world understood that nature can have a temper. And in some ways, the pandemic focused people on the importance of treating nature the right way. The third thing that's happened is what I'll call the Larry Fink effect, which is investors began to push on this issue. Those of us who invest, we always can make a lot of noise. We can push people are actually doing. Um, so if your CEOs get it, your customers get it, and your investors get it, things begin to happen. Right. And it's great that the government got there first, but this, this flywheel got started. And then the fourth point was, and I'm sure you've talked about it this week, that we hit a technological tipping point. People thought that solar would go down 40% in the last decade. It went down 90. We are now at uh, grid, uh, we're, we're now at grid equivalency in 72% of global GDP for solar costs, close to that for wind. And as you know, EVs are now cost competitive, total cost of ownership soon to be off the lot. So these four things in a couple of years, I mean, we've never seen things line up quite this way all at once. Bottoms up, we began to see in Rise a fundamental change in the quality and shape of the companies we were seeing. And so over a relatively short period of time, we built a 
portfolio, which you and I can talk about a little bit of 20 climate related companies. And that quickly began to swamp what we were doing at Rise. And so we said, this is both a generational need and the other side of the coin, a generational opportunity. Uh, so we decided to expand the, rent, the, the uh, Rise franchise. Uh, Hank Paulson joined us because in some ways we are at the intersection of crisis, business, government, and a need. If you think of, you know, when has crisis, business, and government had to come together? He's Hank he's Paulson. The man. Yep, he's, <laughs> he's the guy. A man. And he's, and he's authentic on this issue. You have to be authentic. Uh, and um, we went out to the marketplace saying no one has ever raised a climate fund better, bigger than a few hundred million dollars, maybe a billion dollars. We went out and said we were seeking three to five. I think I can't announce anything because this is all public, but, but that's going well. And uh, it's been a fabulous journey. What did we learn? First of all, yeah, what about the uh, 600 calls? Tell us. Well, 600 calls, we're, we're in the middle of a pandemic on Zoom, launching a new product of epic scale for you know, a new product in a new sector, right? This is, this is you know, I, I got more white hair just saying, can you even do this? Um, and so we began calling around the world. And what we found is um, there are, and every, the higher you got in the organization, the more this resonated. So if you're a CIO today at, a, at one of the largest pools of capital in the world, you understand you have to go beyond an ESG strategy. You have to right. have a risk reward strategy for climate. Right. And there, there isn't, um, you know, maybe we go back on, on the, 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 the landscape to funds. So um, there isn't a, there isn't a, way to do this outside of the venture world. Um, and if you're a CEO of a company, we'll have a number of companies invest with us. This is, you know, two years ago, if I called the CIO or the company, they might've sent us to somebody three levels below their GC who is based on, you know, sustainability. Now it's like front and center for the company. So there's this odd thing. There's a general agreement that this is happening. This is going to take a lot of capital. And yet, if you look at how the private market and the capital markets are set up for it, uh, this is a count we did of, of if you go through the frequent database and ask people what the core strategy of a fund is, if you wanted to invest in the technological revolution, you could create the 194th fund greater than a billion dollars that right. invests in it. Right. If you want to invest in climate, which we just showed is much bigger in terms of the capital need, there's barely 10. And... Most of them are infrastructure, 8% return threshold. So there's a, there's a need and opportunity. So we've gone out and engaged on this issue. And I would say that, um, well, uh, doing this in Zoom has been uh, challenging and interesting in a lot of ways. Um, the reception has been very strong. And, so Jim, uh, we, I, I, and, and by the way, this is a personal mission for me too, Bill, as you know. Um, yeah, I do know that. Two things. For, first of all, one of, the, one of the things that I learned at Dartmouth is solve the problem. I was a Dartmouth uh, you know, engineer and solve the problem. And the problem here is we know we have to ignite a huge amount of capital against this problem and the capital isn't lined up. Everyone on this conference is trying to do their part. I believe that. Right. My part was I could ignite, <clears throat> I could help ignite capital. So the job here is to solve this problem. How do we bring capital, focus on the issue? And uh, that is what I can do to help this revolution. So, so look, this, this slide shows us we're in the second inning. And as, as has been the case so often in your career, and I've, I've followed you with great admiration, you're almost always ahead of the rest of us. So I, I wish we had time not just to talk about the fourth wave. Maybe you know what the fifth wave is going to be. In which case, Biotech. Dartmouth could stand up and institute, <laughs> and you know, you'd save us a lot of time. But, but you said you just—I think some specifics might be interesting. So you said you've made twenty, I think, investments so far. Can yeah. you just give us? And I want to leave time for questions because part of what we're supposed to do here is figure out how to take some questions. Um, and I know Rosie is thinking of one right now. So, can you tell us a little bit? Are you able to tell us a little bit about maybe two or three of the companies to give us a sense of what you're doing? Yeah, we we're trying to figure out how to do this because you know it's interesting. Um, Bill, there's, there's so much um, connection and focus on this issue and so much interest in creating climate companies. 
but we have so few to talk about and we, we haven't seen this executed. Like if, if you go to Greylock, your firm's uh, venture capital site, you will understand what venture capital is, but what does climate investing look like? And uh, so I'm gonna try something. I don't know if we can actually do it this fast. So I, I can't see exactly what's on the screen, but I'm gonna do a quick speed date of our portfolio companies, just so you have a sense of you know, what this looks like. Because as I said, this is not one type of investing in one type of industry. This is sorting the investment universe on which ones have a substantial effect on reducing the carbon footprint of the counterfactual. So what do I mean by that? They're replacing other parts of the carbon environment in a way that through their existence reduces the carbon footprint of society. So let me just spin through a matrix, matrix renewables company we created doing two gig of projects across Europe and Latin America. Think of this as a solar development uh, company. Uh, next, um, a fourth partner energy. We are the largest rooftop solar provider in India, a company that has an enormous grid problem. Next, we uh, built uh, a connection between hydroelectric power and the major cities of Brazil, a company called Evotes, Evil to allowing hydropower to replace coal power in cities. Uh, next, EV box. We uh, co own the largest producer of charging boxes for electric vehicles in Europe, 200, large, 200 points uh, installed across 70 countries in Euro, Europe. Uh, NEO, which is a leading OEM for uh, uh, EVs in China. BRS, we built the first. LEED certified steel plant. It produces steel at 93% less emissions than the capacity it bumped out of the system. It's 5% of US steel in a, in a startup. We, next slide, we um, conserve uh, 7 million acres across, uh, across Africa, uh, stopping deforestation using ecotourism as a base. Next slide, we're the largest producer of plant-based foods in, <coughs> in Hong Kong and South East Asia. Next slide. We're the biggest producer of AI related solutions for the energy industry through a company called C3 AI. Next slide. We um, are the leading independent producer of carbon credits in, uh, in the US marketplaces, serving customers like Google, Microsoft, uh, Walmart uh, with their carbon credit needs as they move to net zero. Next slide. Clear results. We're the, uh, one of the two largest providers of building and residential energy efficiency projects, working as a service provider to, uh, to utilities. Next slide, uh, this is a company recently featured on the cover of Time Magazine, uh, Grow Intelligence, which has been called the Bloomberg of Climate. It's a massive database that gives yeah, um, she's climate an amazing, data. She's an amazing leader, that woman. Wow. Amazing, yeah, amazing leader, if you follow the things. Uh, next slide. Um, uh, we're early investors in a company that is revolution potentially can revolutionize the plastic business with a biocatalyst driven methane uh, uh, based uh, biodegradable plastic. If you go to Shake Shack today, the straws and cutlery and Shake Shack are carbon negative and you throw them in the ocean, they'll biodegrade. Uh, Live Kindly is a company that is a leading plant-based food player across Europe. It, it, if Beyond Meats is doing, is doing beef, they do chicken. And lastly, one of my personal favorites is we're changing the face of commuting with e-bikes delivered at half the price through a direct to consumer solution uh, called Rad Bikes. Send so, 100 of those to Hanover. Yeah, oh, that'd be great in Hanover. So the, uh, um, it turns out that a lot of people would commute on bikes, but there's that one hill and this takes yeah. care of, of, of the one hill. So yeah. this, is a this is a sampling. I can tell you our pipeline is, is filled with these opportunities. The, the investment sizes range from 50 million to a billion. And, uh, but all of them are in indirect ways approaching this problem. So I, I just want to give you a little bit of that picture yeah. because we're in the early days of seeing what it could be. We have a long way to go in terms of proving it successful and at the scale it's needed, but every journey begins with a step and, and that's where we are. Uh, but Jim, I'm struck by how, first of all, how international your portfolio is. And second, secondly, you know, to tie it back to why we're here, I mean, the Arthur Lee Irving energy and society, energy and society. I mean, both of those play into, you use the word climate, but energy and society could have been used in every single one of those investments, frankly, in every single thing that you've spoken about so far. And it just, again, once again, shows the importance 
I wonder if Mr. Irving even knew that I knew his middle name was Lee. Well, never mind. That's, that's not <laughs> important. But it just shows how, how relevant uh, what Dartmouth is doing. And, and I want to get into that sort of for the last thing before we go to questions, which is, um, I mean, you and I uh, would do anything for Dartmouth. We, it, it's, it's had such an important role in, in helping us to be what we are today. Somehow you seem to have gotten more out of it than I did. I wish I had paid a little more attention, but I mean, Dartmouth can play a role here, right? I mean, Dartmouth creation, research, creation of knowledge. Tra I mean, the Irvings are really focused on students and, and, and training and educating leaders in this sector. You must have some thoughts on how Dartmouth can participate and lead in this incredibly interesting second inning, as you've described, um, energy and society climate world. Bill, of, of course, Dartmouth can play a role. And I would go much beyond that. Dartmouth must play a role. You know, and, and all of us have to do what we can. Uh, but this is a, a fundamental problem. And it's a problem that combines raw science, behavior, um, all facets of society. It's a systems problem. And Dartmouth, because there are no walls in the Dartmouth systems, there isn't, you know, grad schools of different types, you know, unconnected, uh, has the ability to reach across the various disciplines to find solutions that uh, can scale, it can work. And uh, I think we have off, always been uh, tied to where we are uh, in New Hampshire, we've always been tied to the importance of the natural world with the intellectual world. And uh, it's never been more clear that those two, how we live and how the world lives, um, have to reorganize themselves in a way that I think Dartmouth can play a major role. So this is a, a Dartmouth type of problem. It's clearly a worthy problem. And it's one that we must engage in. I couldn't agree with you more. I could not agree with you more. Okay, let's go to questions. The first question is an easy one. Is there any way to get your slides? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I don't know. Let me see. Let me see that. We can probably hand. I, 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 I'm not sure we'll hand them all out because uh, I tend to have a lot of compliance people that don't like me handing things out when I'm in the middle of a fundraise bill. So uh, I yeah. may have to put that off for a while. Yeah. Yeah. OK. I'm trying to figure out how to get the questions, which is not easy on this system. What are the best places to invest? Now, you've sort of answered that, I think. Um, uh, let's well, go to this I, question. I think. Um, uh, what, what I've learned in these sectors is there's many, many, many places to invest. I, I think um, the, the best answer is where do you have differential insight and um, capabilities? So I, I think, um, uh, and where are others maybe not paying enough attention? One of the mm -hmm. issues that we have now, Bill, is that certain parts of this ecosystem are just easier to understand. And um, you know, so solar development and electric vehicles are really easy. So if you just sort of whisper them and show up in the stock market, like everyone wants to throw money at it. It was like the, the early days when people were throwing money at AOL, no one thought to throw money at, at uh, you know, the, uh, what became AWS or, or uh, you know, the, 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 the web, it hadn't even been created yet. Uh, so I think um, I would uh, pay attention to what you know, pay attention to the broader trend, but also try to think a couple levels deep as to what others are not focusing on that will come out of this, this broad movement. I mean, Jim, for, for all of us, all 1,000 of us, we, we, all, we all are mobile. So our mobility is going to change, right? We might have an electric bike, such as you just suggested. We might have autonomous vehicles. There's certainly a lot of capital going into autonomous vehicles. Our lives are gonna change in terms of the way we consume, consume food. You've already talked about that also. You had one of the companies I think was the leading alternative protein source in Brazil. I mean, what other ways are, 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 are we all gonna be vegetarians? Or what's gonna, tell us how our personal lives <laughs> the, new the new term is flexitarian, right? So one of our companies, the one that's in Southeast Asia is called Green Monday because there's a movement in Asia to have you know all all eating on green on Mondays to be to be non meat based. So 
Um, you know, I, th I think uh, one of the things we all learned at Dartmouth is uh, if, if you took math five was you had to, you know, go to the third derivative and kind of think through it. So just let's take EVs for a second and think of them as a revolution, because I know it's something that, um, you know, the Irvings know and that we, we've all seen this. So if you begin to think about EVs, uh, everyone's focused on which one you might drive, but the core of an EV is really batteries. And right now the battleground is how far you have to go without a charge. Mm -hmm. So if you get into batteries, there's like a whole new set of investment situations. So talk to a company the other day that is basically saying a lot of the key rare earth elements in batteries are not available in the US. So what they're doing is trying to create a, um, a circular economy recycling for batteries that will essentially be the equivalent of cobalt mining in the US because batteries yeah. will never leave the US. There'll be a closed loop here. So yep. that type of problem, which is a business model that doesn't fully exist today, is, is becomes a absolutely critical part of it. And then you got to make it, you know, are you betting on the anode or are you betting on the cathode? So you begin to get into huge parts of it. Then you get into the charging dynamics. And so if you take, for example, our company EV Box in Europe, it's think of it like a bit like Peloton, which is they make the boxes, they sell them but they make a lot of their, their return from actually managing them through a software solution that allows. So for example, in Europe, a lot of the cars are, are owned by, um, by leasing companies. In the old days, the, the employee could buy gas using a card. How do you reimburse the employee when they're charging at home on their personal grid? So you have to create a whole system to do that. So it becomes a software solution, not a not a hardware solution. And then right. if they're charging at home, where do you want to own charges? Well, you really want to own charges on the motorways, which um, allow EVs to get over their current problem, which is I'm scared to take them for a long drive. Right. So there's just this, this layer. If you're thinking about where to uh, place your personal bets, your investment bets, et cetera, it doesn't matter if you're an investor or just someone who wants to help on this. You know, Go several layers deep. We learned that at Dartmouth the Institute is set up to address questions in those ways. Uh, we're, we're so early in the wave and there's so much to go. You know, one of the, uh, I, I heard this at the Dartmouth, uh, their uh, graduation one time and, and the speaker said, technology goes in strange directions. We put men on the moon before we put wheels on suitcases. And it's true, we didn't put wheels on suitcases until 1972. So, you know, someone should have thought of that a while before. So the, we're, we're gonna debate green hydrogen, blue hydrogen, batteries, solid state batteries, just get in the game because the path will be uncertain, but the journey is clearly happening. So there's a question about hydrogen technology. Are you, are you a fan? Do you think it's an important? Uh, I think um, there's, there's a few questions of where it all ends up. And so uh, there's, a, there's a position that, it ends in hydrogen. Remember, every all the world's a battery built. Like trees were batteries, coal right. is a battery. You know, as you store energy and you use it, hydrogen is a particularly interesting way to store hydrogen. Right now, for most applications, really almost all applications, it's not cost competitive. But neither was solar a while ago. So we got to figure out where that journey goes, and um, we're not there today. Just like we're not there on carbon capture, but right. I, I didn't think the technological re uh, revolution was going to end up with me watching TikTok on an iPhone, right? So, you know, th th this journey is going to move in interesting ways. Now that's interesting. You I, please tell me you you do you're a TikTok user. Uh, I have used TikTok because I've got I've got twenty somethings, Bill, and otherwise you I you know have no idea what they're up to. So I, I think the level of innovation, so I, I, I'm more of an innovation guy than, than you're more of a capital guy. But when I, hear, when I hear people talk about the creativity around this set of problems, I still find it pretty interesting and pretty amazing, right? Carbon sequestration in seaweed. Uh, I mean, there's just so much going on. And I think to me, one of the most important things you said is we just got to get going. We yeah. just got to, you know, we got to make the bets and get going. There's a, so I, I have a, uh preach to all of us here and I preached our firm by sometimes called the Nike strategy, just do it. So there is, right. there is a, there is a huge amount of debate now on this question of what should companies report? How do you report? How do you measure? What does net zero mean, et cetera. And all that debate is really important. And there are things that Dartmouth and the Institute can help 
sort out. But you have to remember that in the finance world, Bill, um, you know, the standard we use is GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles. That took 70 years to develop. Wow. Wow. And it took Moody's 50 years to come up with the A, B, B minus, B plus bond rating. So while we're coming up with the standards, the reporting, all of which, you know, transparency to disclosure, we just got to go do it. And we'll get better as we practice it. We'll build, we'll learn, and we'll attack. Every, every molecule yeah, that with we you. take out today is, is, is part of the solution. And, um, you know, we can't, can't wait too long. I feel very lucky that you're on this. I really mean that. There's another question that talks about, and I think this is a really important topic, and we see this at Ford, um, the precious minerals that are required for many of these technologies and for many of the products and services to be successful are limited and also mined in some places that are pretty, you know, pretty rough, not, not fair. How do, you, how do you think about that, that set of issues? Um, I think there are very, that's why we brought the recycling opportunity I was talking yeah. about. So we yeah. have to, um, I mean, Bill, you and I lived in technology. I'm not sure if someone sat down the first day, they would draw out the chip and uh, iPhone supply chain, right? There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of vagaries in that. You know, we see this coming. We're going to have to uh, have a plan. The, the sheer TAM of batteries, as we now understand it, is so large that the constraint may be nickel and cobalt. Right. Uh, I think that's so, the point of the question. Um, yeah. But right. So that absolutely the point that we had that question. Great. It's a question. Let's go find the answer. And the question, may, the answer may be new materials. It may be recycling business models. It may be uh, really forcing supplier um, standards of care into the system. Uh, but as I said before, this is a systems problem. And you put your, that question, put its finger on, a, on a, one of the big challenges in the system. Yeah, I totally agree with that. All right. I think we're about to, we're sort of in the last few minutes here. Um, I can't thank you enough for doing this. I, I really do believe that very few people I've met in my, I'm now getting pretty old, have the ability to bring things together the way you do. You call it a systems problem. I think we should be calling them a culture problem, culture solution. I, I really appreciate your tying it all together and uh, taking the time. And, and are there any closing thoughts? And then, and then I think we go to our, our close. We have, we, we have a closer on board today like in baseball, um, she, she's, she's, <laughs> oh, in, I, I, he's in the, she's in the bullpen. Well, Bill, you've been um, more than, than kind with your, your praise, none of which I deserve, but the, I think the important thing is this is a worthy problem, an extraordinarily important one. And we're no longer debating the why or what of it. It's we're, we, we have to be debating the, the how and now. And you know uh, the how is something that that we can do a lot at Dartmouth, but each of us also have to choose to do what we can, and it goes from the vehicles we drive and the materials you use to how you can define your own path to add value. I'm trying to define a path to add value. They're doing what I do, uh, but uh, this will this is a collective problem we've created. And it will take a collective answer to solve the system. And so I'm, I'm engaged. I'm thrilled that Dartmouth and the Institute is engaged. And, and I hope all the attendees, I'm sure they are because they're, they're here and interested, will find their own way to engage. Yeah, I think if we each do our part, uh, it will add up to something very, very substantial. I couldn't agree with you more. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jim. And... I'm not exactly sure. Do we just go right into the clo our closer who's in the bullpen? Is that what we do? Is somebody going to tell me that? Laurel? I'm here. Okay. So my next responsibility, and I can't wait for this, is to uh, introduce uh, Laurel Ritchie, who is our closer. It's a role that Laurel plays often. It's a role that Laurel uh, excels at. And as is the practice, I showed you earlier, where is it? I have also a long list of Laurel's accomplishments, a long list of her career accomplishments. It's somewhere in here, it's right there. And um, to be consistent, I'm not gonna read any of them. I'm gonna ignore what I was told to do. It does say at the very end, 
please offer a personal anecdote. And I would like to do that. And I don't believe this is an anecdote that is personal to me. I think it's one that's shared by many, many, many. And uh, here goes, no one, and I mean no one, has served Dartmouth like Laura Ritchie. More talks, more discussions, more speeches, more board meetings, more strategic thinking, more miles on our behalf. The cliche, she's done it all, is not a cliche when it comes to Laurel Ritchie. She is tireless in her support, in her unwavering quest for excellence at Dartmouth. And, you know, whether it's the campaign, which has been more recent, whether it's what, I mean, it just, you, I cannot say enough. As you know, she serves as the chair of our board and um, she doesn't know the word no. She just does it all. I'm not exactly sure how to do a standing ovation on Zoom. And I think the reason I'm not so sure is because most people don't wear pants, um, but, <laughs> but, but I'm pretty certain that all 1,000 of us would be, I mean, if I, I, I did put pants on, obviously, I'm pretty certain that all 1,000 of us are standing right now and clapping wildly with a standing ovation for the chair of our board, class of 81, and our closer, Laurel Ritchie. Mwah. Well, kiss you, received, Laurel. kiss received, and thank you, Bill. It, you know, it's always a treat uh, to follow you because you just never quite know what that intro is going to be. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and thanks actually both to you and to Jim, um, joining the two of you for this incredibly thought provoking um, final session brought back some really fond memories uh, of serving with the two of you as trustees. Um, you know, I've learned over the years that we all bring different gifts to our board service and the two of you sort of are at the head of the pack in terms of bold thinking about the future and ways in which you manage to both challenge and inspire us in, in everything you do and every conversation you lead. So thank you so much for, for, this, uh, for this past session. Uh, you know, I've been thinking a lot about um, back to 2016 when we introduced the Institute for Energy and Society. Um, we knew that Dartmouth would deliver in helping the Institute realize its full potential. And we also knew that we would do it in a distinctly Dartmouth way, you know, so this institute has liberal arts at the core. Uh, it is global, it is interdisciplinary, and it um, has a focus on thinking um, and bringing an external view to the campus. So as I sit and listen and think about the last couple of days, I couldn't be more excited that the Institute has sort of stayed true to the vision that we set forth uh, back in 2016. I've also been thinking over the last couple of days, just how lucky um, the young students who are coming to our campus, to Dartmouth, to Thayer, to talk to Geisel, to Guarini, how lucky they are for those who have an interest and a passion for energy to be able through the Institute to explore this field in all of its depth and all of its breadth. So in that sense, the Institute is delivering very much on the vision we set forth. I've also been thinking about how, you know, one of the, the core functions of an Institute is, is convening and convening conversations and this conference with its incredible programming and incredible audience has manifest this brilliantly. You know, I can only imagine how wonderful it's gonna be at the next conference and hopefully one where we can do it all together in person. If we've been able to do this in a virtual world, you know, hold on to your hats when we can be together in person. Um, I wanna thank our fearless leaders, uh, Phil and Elizabeth, uh, the advisory board, the institute staff, all of the speakers and everyone who participated and joined in for one or more of the sessions. I can't thank you enough for helping to make this inaugural convening a success, right? There's nothing like your first one. And I think we can all be really proud of what we accomplished with this one. I am sending a huge um, bear hug of a thank you to the Irvings, to Arthur, Arthur and to Sandra and to Sarah. Um, 
you inspire us through the way in which you lead your lives um, full of passion for energy and for society. We feel it every day and it fuels our work. So we're incredibly grateful for your leadership and your example. Um, you know, I don't know whether it is um, channeling uh, one of Dartmouth's early alums, John Ledyard, or thinking and connecting with our good friends in Canada to the north. But at Dartmouth, we evoke the idea of a canoe when we want to talk about great acts of teamwork. And when it comes to this institute, we have a big canoe and we have a big team of people who've been paddling furiously over the last couple of years. Um, together as a team, we've raised over $140 million to support the Institute's programming and its people, and to build, as Sandra said earlier, this beautiful light-filled uh, new building and new home for the Institute. And I think um, as board chair and a lover of Dartmouth and someone who's passionate about this institute, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that there's still some more room in the canoe. Uh, we have eight, $19 million um, left to raise as we are paddling furiously together toward the goal of our opening at the end of the year. So if you've joined us already in this work, thank you. If you haven't, as I said, there's still more room in the canoe and we'd love to have you join us in any way that works for you. So think about that. Um, and I guess the last thing I would like to say is uh, I do look forward to a time when we're together. Uh, it's been great to be with you virtually, but really looking forward to us gathering together uh, in Hanover uh, with the Connecticut River below us and the beautiful mountain, white mountains rising up all around us. And I can just imagine all of us continuing these conversations, sitting in the newly opened Arthur L. Inst Irving Institute, uh, for energy and society. So thank you for being with us on this inaugural journey. We look forward to continuing with us. Uh, we look forward to welcoming you to the canoe. Uh, I hope everybody stays safe and can't wait to be with you again soon. So thanks.